Canning your own food. This is a process that uh, for some people is extremely intimidating and with good reason. You can uh, do very serious damage to your health if you go about these things in the wrong way. Because of this, a lot of people have abandoned this practice that has been passed down through generations within families in favor of the convenience of outsourcing responsibility for food safety to some corporation. Now, by and large, the, the food that you can buy canned in the grocery store is free from disease-causing pathogens and those sorts of things. That doesn't necessarily mean that it is safe, however. Most of these cans, these aluminum cans, first of all, you're storing your food in aluminum, which has been linked to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative conditions. These cans are also lined typically with bisphenol A plastic, which is an estrogen mimicking neuroexcitotoxin. So if you want to have good quality canned food, you need to do it yourself. If you're a homesteader and you're producing an excess of tomatoes or meat or green beans, all of these lovely things that we want to preserve for eating in the winter time, then understanding this skill set will allow you to create shelf stable food that can last for months and years if done properly. So in this video, what I aim to do is to give you all of the information and all of the science that will enable you to can almost anything. There are a very few exceptions of things that you produce or purchase at a farmer's market that you can't can yourself. And I'll get into those as well and why we don't can those things and why you wouldn't necessarily want to anyway. So I'm going to go through step by step. This is a lot of information. I've written a full blog post with all of everything from the scientific names to the microbiology involved, tables for times, temperatures, pH levels, all of the technical information you can refer in the, uh, in the description section below. You can refer to a link there. It will take you to my blog post uh, covering, covering all of this information. But some people learn better visually, some people learn be better uh, through reading. So. We'll do both platforms and hopefully you can get something really good out of this. It's, it's going to give you the knowledge that is so powerful about food preservation that is almost lost to our ancestors as we've moved into this modern era. So let's get down to the nitty gritty. Well, with uh, learning anything new, I like to uh, refer to the old Greek trivium method of looking at the grammar logic and rhetoric. So the grammar is going to be the names of the things, uh, the uh, things we need to be able to call by their name in order to arrange them in some sort of logic and then put it all together into a rhetoric that describes the entire process. So starting out, there are uh, tools and equipment that we're going to be dealing with. You have two types of canning apparatus. One being a water bath canner, which is nothing more than a large pot. Often the purpose built variety of this is going to be a black um, enameled steel pot that uh, oftentimes will come with a little basket that you can put the jars in and lift out. Um, but you could use any pot that's large enough to cover your jars that you're going to be canning by a half inch. So that's a water bath canner. The other option is a pressure canner. Now a pressure canner is an appliance that has a seal on the lid, a locking lid, and it will get up to higher pressures which will increase the temperature at which the water will boil within it. And we'll get into the science on that in just a minute. Other things you're going to need, handy to have jar tongs that will allow you to lift jars out of hot water 
and set them safely on the counter when you're done. You have two most common types of jars, a quart jar, a pint jar. So this one holds four cups, this one holds two cups. On top of the jar, you have a band. The band is the threaded portion that holds on the lid. The lid has a seal on the inside. That's a rubber seal that will cause a airtight seal between the outside environment and the contents of the jar. So when we're preparing our jars to can, what we want to do is we want to pay special attention to this rim here. Make sure there are no chips, defects, bumps, anything on that rim because that will inter interfere with the ability of the lid rubber to create that seal when we can our product. Other things you might like to have, uh, you can get a magnetic lid lifter. We're going to be softening the seals on these lids in uh, boiling water, not in a boiling pot, but by pouring boiling water on them. And to remove them without burning your tender little fingers, a magnetic lid lifter can be handy. Personally, I pour the boiling water over the lids, let them sit for about five minutes, and then once I've filled all my jars, wiped the rims, prepped them to can, I'll dump off that water and just pick the lids up and put them on. I don't think there's a, a very large contamination risk handling the edges with my fingers. So that's my personal method. The prescribed method though is to not touch those lids once they've been hit with that hot water. I'll leave it up to you. So once you have these you know, certain pieces of equipment, you're equipped to can things for decades to come. Some of the jars I'm using today, I'll grab one here, like this one, that is an actual mason jar. This company eventually, I, I believe, became Ball, and um, Kerr is the other major manufacturer, and I believe that Ball bought Kerr, and it's all the same company now. But this jar, with this wide rim that actually says mason jar on it, maybe 100 years old. So still perfectly serviceable, not disposable, not leaving plastic in the environment, microplastics in the rain, plastic straws up turtle noses, reusable indefinitely until it breaks. So the canners last forever. Occasionally you'll need to replace lids and we'll talk in, in depth about my philosophy on lids and rings and all of that uh, in, later in the video. But making this choice is going to put you in a situation where you're actually doing something that's sustainable. So now, let's get into what people tend to be afraid about when it comes to home camping. In the world of, world of microbiology, you've got a whole host of things that live and thrive in the same conditions we do, which is an oxygen-rich environment at a temperature range somewhere between freezing and 100 degrees for the most part, sometimes colder, sometimes hotter, in that range. and. That is how things have evolved in the natural world to this point. However, there are still some things that are hanging around from way before, before there were single-celled algaes, before the production of oxygen in the environment. Some of these life forms are still here. One of them is Clostridium botulinum. This is a bacteria. It does not thrive in conditions that you'll normally experience on modern planet Earth. It's from a time way before. What it likes is a high or neutral pH environment and the absence of oxygen. So, C. botulinum is around us all the time. It's on your skin right now. It's in your lungs. You're breathing it in. It's on everything. It's in the dirt. It's in the dust on your furniture. Okay. But it's not dangerous to you because 
unless it's in a very specific set of circumstances, it remains in a systal stage. So it's basically cocooned up and waiting until the Earth returns to the environment that it was hundreds of millions of years ago. Now, in the proper environment. So, preferably dark, absence of oxygen in a vacuum or low oxygen environment in a pH from the neutral to high range, so alkaline, it will go into an active stage and it will start sending out spores. And the spores of C. botulinum produce a botulism toxin. Now the botulism toxin is a neurotoxin. This is the big danger that people get really concerned about and so they avoid canning food at home and just buy it at the grocery store. But it's easy to get around this. In our two types of canning, we have water bath canning and pressure canning. You can water bath can foods that have a low pH because even though the botulism and the uh, C. botulinum bacteria will not be destroyed by a water bath canning process, the environment within the jar will be inhospitable for them and they will remain in a systole stage just like the ones that you're breathing right now and therefore be safe. So, the magic number for water bath canning is a pH of 4.6 or lower or more acidic than 4.6. So, what foods fall into that category? All fruits are more acidic than that usually in that 3.1 to 4 range, most fruits. So, canning fruits, you can do that, no problem, in your water bath canner. Tomatoes are right on the line. So, if you buy a store-bought uh, tomato, it has been harvested green and then force ripened with ethylene gas. That's why the tomatoes you buy in the grocery store appear red, but when you cut them open inside, they're pink, slightly blonde, maybe even greenish, they have no flavor. Those tomatoes are going to be more acidic than an actual vine-ripened heirloom tomato because they have not been on the vine to fully develop the sugars that happen in an actual vine-ripened tomato. So the range that we're looking at for tomatoes is between 3.8 pH and 4.8 pH. So you'll notice that high end of the scale is outside of the range for safe water bath canning. In other words, if you've got super ripe, glorious tomatoes and you don't add any other acid to them when you can them, they could be at 4.8, they could be a breeding ground for botulism. So you've got two choices. You can either supplement the acidity or pressure can. We'll get some more into the details of, of best ways to supplement acidity in a minute, but for now, uh, let's look at pressure canning. So pressure canning is going to take care of the C. botulinum problem in a different manner. It's going to do it through sterilization. The problem is that this little bugger can survive to pretty high temperatures, temperatures that you would not normally see in the environment. The number we're looking for here is a suspended duration at 240 degrees Fahrenheit. The problem with using a water bath canner to can low acid foods is that the water can only get to 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius. That's the boiling point. After that, it's no longer water. If it were to get hotter than that, it would just evaporate and become steam. And you cannot get the contents of the jars up to that temperature. And that's why we use a pressure canner. The idea behind a pressure canner, even if you, if you look at atmospheric pressure at different elevations just out in the world, where I am, 5280 mile high, the pressure from the atmosphere is much less than it is at sea level because there's less of it above me. This means that at sea level, there's less pressure on the water, or more pressure on the water, excuse me, 
than there is where I am. And so the water will boil at 212 degrees and turn into steam from there. Where I am, water boils at a lower temperature because there's less pressure arresting the conversion from the liquid state to the gaseous state of the water. So this comes into play when we're pressure canning. The idea that's important there is that the water boils at a higher temperature the more pressure there is. So hotter at sea level than it is in Colorado. Now, with the pressure cooker appliance, what we're doing is we're sealing an environment and we're using a weight or some sort of a regulatory uh, appliance to artificially affect the pressure within that vessel, which will allow us to boil water at a higher temperature. So it's like taking everything to another planet and changing the temperature at which water boils. So um, in the blog post about this, there'll be a full chart that shows you what pressures in pounds per square inch we can certain things at the times uh, to do that but in pressure canning we can now save non-acidic foods low acid foods meat vegetables things of that nature now we get to the part about the things that you cannot can either in a water bath canning application or pressure canning application Really, it's pumpkin. Um, other winter squashes can be difficult. There's something about if you mash it, fill a can with it, it's very difficult to get the core of that can, particularly if it's a quart, up to 240 degrees. And you really wouldn't necessarily want to can these sorts of things anyway because they're already shelf stable. That's how they grow. They come out of the garden in a hard shell. That's why they call them winter squash. You just put it on a shelf. You can put a butternut squash at room temperature in full sunlight for a year and a half before it's gonna degrade. So rather than canning these sorts of things, we'll just let them stay in the shell they came in and use them fresh like that. But pretty much anything else, stock, your own homemade soup, okra. All right, so when we want to use a water bath canning method on things like vegetables that are naturally low acid foods, we do what's called pickling. And that essentially is artificially increasing the acidity, lowering the pH of cucumbers to make pickles, dilly beans, beets, all these foods that are not fruits and don't have enough acidity on their own to be safe to water bath can, we can do that if we add vinegar, citric acid, lemon juice, things that are acidic. They're going to get us back into that safe pH range below 4.6. Pickling is different than fermentation. Fermentation is using salt and vegetables to create an environment that is hospitable to naturally occurring bacteria that are already on the plant and will break down the starches and all the carbon molecules in that plant and in the process of digesting them produce lactic acid. So primarily we're talking about lactobacillus bacteria. So as the lactobacillus bacillus eats the sugar in the vegetable matter, your cabbage for sauerkraut, your fermented pickles, hot sauce, ketchup is actually traditionally a fermented food, then it's going to increase the acidity. This is the same sort of, of biochemistry that allows us to make cheese as a way to preserve milk. We're going to inoculate it with a culture that is going to convert sugars into an acidic environment within that food product. So here's the thing. Yes, you can ferment vegetables to increase the acidity and get the pH below 4.6 and then can them. 
if, however, you are fermenting foods to have a source of probiotic dietary supplement, if you can them, you're going to kill all of that microbiology. It's going to be safe, it's going to be shelf stable, but it's not going to have the microbiotic benefit that you're, the probiotic benefit that you're looking for if you're fermenting for gut health and things like that. These sorts of foods, because they're alive, can be stored either at cellar temperature, around 54 degrees or so, where they will continue to get a little more sour and a little more sour as time goes on, or under refrigeration, where you'll still have all of your probiotic benefit, the flavor won't change much at that temperature because the lactobacillus essentially become inactive and dormant. Or, as I said, you can can them, you're going to kill the bacteria, but it's essentially going to be the same net effect as if you were to pickle using vinegar. Now here's the other thing about adding supplemental acids to foods that we can. Most jam recipes that you see will call for the addition of lemon juice. Um, there are a couple of reasons why this is done. Several, actually. First of all, you're ensuring that you're a very low acid food at that point, and particularly with things like tomato sauce and that sort of thing. So, you know, we could add vinegar, lemon juice. You can buy citric acid in a powder, and that's going to have less of a flavor effect on your net product because it doesn't taste like lemon juice it doesn't taste like acid or, or like vinegar it just has an acidity to it that's going to kind of brighten flavors so that's the second reason that we add things like lemon juice to jam is that by putting that acidity in there the effect on the flavor profile is that acidity happens early in the flavor experience and so it's going to brighten the taste of things and cause the, the natural flavor of the fruit to bloom more completely in the mouth. The third reason is that the, oftentimes when we're making jams and jellies, we're using pectin, which is essentially a fruit derived substance. Like if you were to dry apple peels and grind them into a powder, you've essentially made a replacement for powdered pectin. And this substance causes a gelling effect in the cooked jam. The acid in lemon juice improves the ability of the pectin to function and gel the fruit. The fourth reason is that acid is an antioxidant. So oxidation, just like when metal rusts, that is a chemical reaction that's occurring slowly over time where the subject substance, a piece of iron, interacts with oxygen, oxidizes, turns from the iron to iron oxide. It's bonded with that oxygen and that causes rust. Well, the same thing happens in food. If you cut an apple and leave it on the counter, it's gonna turn brown. Oxidation, same thing. The presence of acidity is going to be an antioxidant. It's going to make it harder for that oxygen molecule to bond with the carbons and the fruits and things like that. And what happens in canned products is they will discolor if there's insufficient acidity. So by adding supplemental acidity, you're going to preserve color retention. The other important thing to do to preserve color retention is to keep your canned goods out of the light. Cool, dark place, right? So. The, the temperature isn't too extreme, there isn't too much light shining on it, that will help you with your color retention. And essentially that's, that's why you see the addition of extra acids and things like jams, even though the fruit itself is probably about 3.4 and perfectly safe to can like that. So flavor, color retention, efficacy of pectins, you get it. <laughs> Thank you.
In addition to water bath canning or pressure canning, you can can and preserve some specific types of foods to a shelf stable condition without using either. Now, these are in situations where what you're canning does not contain water. So in other words, lard. When we process a hog here on the farm, we save every bit of fat. There are two kinds of fat on a pig. You have back fat and you have leaf lard. So around the outside of the entire animal, and particularly with the pastured uh, ho lard hogs that I raise, kunikunis and mangalitsas, you've got a very thick layer of fat. This is great lard for frying and um, you know, you can use it to make soap, all sorts of culinary uses and household uses for this product. Axle grease, you know. Um, inside of the abdominal cavity, there is another layer of fat, kind of sits on top of the, of the bacon on the pork belly. It's very fine grained, called leaf lard. Leaf lard is fantastic for use in pastries, pie crust, things like that. So, in order to can this, I don't need to use the pressure canner, even though it's a low acid food. I don't need to use the water bath canner because when I render the fat, I'm taking it up to 275 degrees. So all I need to do is make sure I've got a sterilized jar. And for that, I'll sterilize them in the oven. I'll always use brand new lids. I'll put the jars in the oven at 250 degrees for 15 minutes and then I'll pour the hot fat that's 275 degrees and little trick by oven sterilizing those jars and getting their temperature up I've got less chance for there to be a heat stress fracture in the glass because they're close to the same temperature hot fat into hot jars wipe the rims put the lids on put the bands on as it cools it's going to seal done you've killed the C. botulinum, nothing to worry about. Same sort of thing can be done with what historically has been called potted meat. And so in the process of, of dressing out a whole hog, you're going to have bits and bobs and scraps and chunks and, and that sort of thing as you're trimming out your various cuts. You can grind these into sausage, but one nice thing to do is to make potted meat. And basically what I'm going to do in a situation like that I'm going to cure the meat by adding salt and usually I'll add a little brown sugar and a variety of spices, cardamom, cinnamon, cinnamon clove, those sorts of things and let that cure for, if they're fairly small pieces, three days or so. Then I'm going to drain that, rinse it, so I've pulled most of the moisture out of the center of the meat and then we're essentially going to confit that. We're going to slow cook that on the stove for hours until the meat essentially is falling apart and it's swimming in a flavored lard. So if I get that above 250 degrees and keep it there for an hour or so, it's going to be much more than that actually because I'm going to take that up to, you know, 250, 275 for a whole day. So I've sterilized it. There's nothing alive in it anymore. That too can just be hot packed into hot jars, lids, rings, done. So the checklist of, of things that you're going to do when you start canning, a canning session, you're going to gather up all your jars, make sure that you've got rings for all of them, lids for all of them, the rims are in good shape, the lids are in good shape. The rings, rust is unsightly on rings, but it's not a health hazard because if you've got a seal, nothing's getting between what's inside the jar and what's outside of it. When I run across rusty rings, I'll pitch them. Occasionally I'll buy new ones with the lids. If I'm water bath canning, I may reuse lids two, three times. As long as the lids aren't bent, there's no flaw in the seal and then I make sure that I check after I can things that I have achieved a good seal 
If I haven't, then that jar goes in the fridge for immediate consumption. Only the jars with really good seals go into the pantry. It is recommended by the manufacturers of these jars and things that you use new lids every time and they're in the business of selling lids. If you're concerned about it, use new lids. If you think that you can make the judgment on your own, I do it all the time. I grow 90% of my own food. Half the year I'm eating out of the pantry and I'm still alive, you know. But make your own choice, you're an adult. So once you've cleaned your jars, you've checked your rims, checked your lids, got your rings ready, all of that, you're gonna wash with warm soapy water, lids, rings, jars, then you're gonna sterilize the jars. You got three ways to do this. I happen to have a dishwasher that has a sterilizing setting on it. So after the wash cycle, it's gonna bring the temperature up to such that it will clean, sterilize any, any bacterial residue on the jars right in the dishwasher. Option two is to plunge your jars into your water bath canner while you're getting everything else together and boil them for 15 minutes. Option three, as I said before, in the oven. A lot of people don't do this anymore, and honestly, I only do it when I'm, you know, uh, doing the lard uh, canning or, or things like that. In the oven, 250 for 15 minutes. It's like an autoclave. It's going to sterilize the jars. So, the old advice about how to handle your lids was put them in a pot, fill it with water, boil them. Well, turns out that excessive boiling of lids can cause a breakdown in that rubber seal and cause a failure to seal on those lids. So the current recommendation from the manufacturers of all this gear is that rather than boiling the lids, like I was saying earlier, you have some boiling water in a kettle, pour that over the lids just to soften that seal so that once they're on that jar and in the canner, they'll nestle down real nice and you won't have any gaps and, and issues with that. Um, the uh, rings, I don't sterilize them. I don't worry about it. Um, as I said, there's, you know, if you've got a seal, then there's no contamination. As long as they've been washed with warm water and rinsed, they were fine. Um, while we're on the subject of the, the bands, the rings, some people leave them on the jars when they store them. Some people remove them. Technically, removing them is better for a couple of reasons. First of all, the rings are going to rust because of residual water that's caught up in the grooves while that ring is on there. And over time, rust is going to eat through the metal and you could have issues. So for the sake of dryness and the preservation of your gear, if you remove the rings before you store your jars, it's better. That being said, I don't do it. For some reason, I just feel better when the rings are on. It looks better to me. There's no good reason other than just an aesthetic reaction that I have to it. Um, it is a good idea if you're not sure about a seal on something. After your jars have come out of the canner and sat for 12 to 24 hours undisturbed on the counter, if you Go through and push all the lids, make sure that they've all sucked down. There's a little button on top of that lid. So if it's canned properly, that sucks down and it won't pop back up. If they flex like this, you don't have a seal, don't put it in the pantry, put it in the fridge and eat it right away. Um, so if after you can something, if you want to know if you've got a good seal, pick it up by the lid. If the whole jar comes with it, you got a seal, you're fine. If the lid comes off, you need to eat it or you could recan it with a new lid. So, once you've checked your seals and everything is cooled completely, you don't want to disturb them while they're cooling because it could cause a, a jostling of that seal and you could lose your seal. Not all that likely, but best practice is to, at least for 12 hours, just let them sit, cool completely, label them, date them, move them to the pantry.
All right, that should be a pretty good overview of what you need to know in order to can. Um, in retrospect, if you're canning fruit, things with a lot of acidity, low pH, you can do it in a water bath canner. If you're canning vegetables, meat, soups, things like that, pressure canner. Refer to the information on the blog post and then you'll have no worries. So following these basic guidelines, yes, there are recipes on the internet in cookbooks from, you know, Ball and, and people like that, that are tested recipes and, and can generally be relied upon. I think it's more important though to understand why uh, things need to be a certain way. And so this you know, kind of comes into play with things like if you're adding other vegetables to tomatoes to can them, say like today, for example, I'm going to be making salsa and using heirloom tomatoes that are very ripe, so I'm probably over the line with the pH, and then I'm going to be adding chilies and onions and garlic and things like that, which is going to end up raising the pH even further may put me at 5, 5.2, you know, probably not. I'll probably still be right around 4.6, 4.7, but bear in mind that if you're adding non-acidic vegetables to a preparation like that, then you got to have a good dose of acidity. Fortunately, it's salsa, so that's going to come in the form of lime juice. So I'll have a bunch of lime juice and when the flavor is good for salsa, you've got sufficient acidity. One trick um, that one can do, you can test the pH. Unfortunately, the commonly available litmus strip that is used to test pH of things like soil and things like that is not scaled either finely enough or in a wide enough range to be very useful in this situation. Typically, litmus strips will allow you to test in 0.5 pH increments, 4.5, 5, 5.5, 6, but they don't test below 4.5, typically. Now, remember, our target number is 4.6, so we need to know whether we're looking at something that's 4.7 or 4.4, and a litmus strip is not accurate enough to do that. Now there are um, uh, devices that can test with more accuracy on that lower pH end of the scale, and there will be a link to such a thing um, in the uh, description for this video. So the reason that could be handy is if you want to, for a flavor profile reason, have a minimum amount of acidity in a tomato product, then you'd want to be able to add just enough acid to get to 4.6, 4.5 without getting it so sharp that it's going to change what you're looking for in terms of flavor. And you can refer to, you know, quantities and recipes online but that's not taking into account your individual tomatoes and their pH, and you may end up, be, end up adding a lot more lemon juice than you might want, or citric acid or whatever. So if you're willing to spend about 40 bucks, you can test down to the tenth of a point of pH and add just enough and know that you're in that safe zone for water bath canning. You can, of course, add no acid and pressure can your tomato products. The only reason you wouldn't want to do that is that a lot of the valuable nutrients within tomatoes, namely vitamin C, uh, tend to degrade at higher temperatures. So the hotter it gets, the less nutrition there is going to be. And, you know, some of that's a bit of a misnomer because largely it just goes into solution in the liquid medium that's around it and is no longer in the tomato. So it's all in there and canned together, but there, there is something to be said for both nutrition and flavor quality having some heat degradation in a pressure canning situation. So it's definitely gonna taste fresher, it's definitely gonna have a brighter color, and probably is more nutritious if it's water bath canned as opposed to pressure canned. So, 
that's why that's important and tomatoes are tricky because they're right on that line. All right, well, I think that pretty much covers it. Of course, if you have questions, you can either ask me questions in the comments section of this video, go to the blog, ask me questions there, go to Instagram, at Radical Gastronomy. I'm always answering questions over there. So if you, if you wanna know anything, I'll do everything I can to help you out. And I strongly encourage you to take up home canning. Not only is it going to empower you to have your own food sovereignty, it's going to allow you to eat locally year round. So if you think about what kind of vegetables and fruits and things are big multinational corporations going to can, well, the ones that aren't pretty enough to sell on the shelf in the store fresh. So it's seconds, it's number twos, not that there's necessarily anything wrong with that, but you're going to have higher quality food if it's you who's selecting the very freshest produce, either from your own garden, from a local grower, from a farmer's market, where instead of canning it because it's not pretty enough to sell, otherwise, you're canning the best stuff. So your flavor is going to be better. Your color is going to be better. Your nutrition is going to be better if you can your own. You're also going to be avoiding all of those environmental contaminants like the aluminum and the BPA, whatever else they're using. Like, you know, if you buy peaches in heavy syrup, guess what? That heavy syrup is high fructose corn syrup from genetically modified corn that has been saturated in glyphosate or Roundup. And so you're not only eating peaches, you're eating one of the most powerful antibiotics known to man in the form of glyphosate. All the other risks that come with that product are going to be in there. So by canning your own, you have control. If you want peaches and heavy syrup, make it with organic cane sugar. Make it with honey, you know, however you want to do it. You have the control. When you have a fully stocked pantry of your own canned goods, not only do you have the satisfaction of being able to see all those beautiful colors and those shining glass jars and have the satisfaction of all the work that you did to not only grow or find the food but to preserve it stock it up and that's really true wealth i mean that's food sovereignty you have complete control over what's gone into it you've been able to source it locally so it hasn't traveled burning diesel fuel from halfway around the world where who knows what actually got on it before they sold it to you to eat and that sort of wealth is better than financial wealth. Because if you have financial wealth, what are you gonna do with that money? You're gonna buy food, right? Well, you just cut out the middleman and produce the food, store it up there. Well, now you know you're gonna eat. And, you know, sometimes you may not be able to get to the grocery store or there may not be anything there as our friends down in Venezuela are experiencing. The world is not as safe and far more tenuous than we would like to think. So by having this skill, you'll always be able to have a fully stocked pantry and that's, that sense of security, that, uh, that sense of ease for you and your family. So I highly encourage checking it out. Um, another thing this, this allows you to do is to forage. So where we are along the front range of uh, the Colorado Rockies here in the Denver Boulder area, there are wild things like choke cherries that grow in the foothills and you can just go out and load up five gallon buckets of choke cherries. Wherever you are, there's something. Even if you're in Arizona, there's prickly pear cactus out there. You can make prickly pear jam. Another great resource for fruit is suburban yards. There are a lot of people who have fruit trees that don't even eat the fruit. It just falls on the ground. They get bitter about it because now the flies are coming and it's a mess. And you know, if nothing happens with that fruit, they're probably just gonna cut that tree down. So 
If you're walking around, driving around, you see a tree full of fruit, knock on the door and say, hey, I saw this. Would you, you know, mind if I took some? And sometimes it's a good thing to, to offer to bring them back some jam. You know, I've done a ton of canning where I get raw materials from a producer, can it all up, take them back half. And now I've got food that has no cost other than my time. So if you look around, there actually are some applications you can use on your phone um, where foragers crowdsource and share information about where things are, are becoming ripe in a geographical area. Uh, lots of fun to be had going out and actually getting your food. The nice thing about getting fruit from people's backyards is typically hasn't been sprayed with anything because to them it's just that tree over there. They're not trying to produce an entire crop of perfectly flawless fruit. They've got no reason to spend the money or the time to spray it. So oftentimes it's beyond the organic standard just because it's sitting in somebody's front yard. So many reasons to get into it and I hope this was helpful and I hope everybody has a fantastic day.